Um, I'm Jim Laris. I'm chairing this, uh, the second system session. Uh, for those of you who don't know yet, uh, this is the final session of PLDI. After this, there's the uh, shared keynote, which you're all welcome to attend, but there is no lunch today. So um, you're on your own. Um, we have three talks in this session, so we'll start uh, with the first talk, uh, Prevail, Simple, Precise Static Analysis of Untrusted Linux Kernel Extensions, and Eliza Gershuni uh, will be presenting the talk. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, this talk is about uh, static analysis of Linux scanner extensions, also known as UPF programs. When you look about on uh, success stories or static analysis, you will notice they all share a common theme. They focus on a strict class of programs and a particular set of properties that are crucial for the uh, safety of the entire system. This talk is about a new application domain that shares these properties. And additionally, it, it has the interesting property that it is already uh, mandatory. It already has a mandatory verifier inside the kernel. And programmers are already writing programs that must pass verification. In this work, we present a new verifier, alternative verifier, that is simple, scalable, precise on existing programs, and improve functionality over the existing verifier. So what are kernel extensions? Let's look at this setting where we have a process, user space process, and the kernel, and consider uh, packets arriving from the kernel. So when packets arrive from the, from the kernel, the user space process cannot handle them. So the kernel must copy them to the user space. But, they, uh, but the process might decide to, that it has no use for them, so we just drop them. What happens is that what happened just is that we copied uh, a very ex we copied a very large packet to the user space uh, for no reason at all. The idea behind kernel extensions is that we can write a, sim a simple program that will serve as, as a filter. We can register this program inside the kernel, and then packets arriving from the kernel to the kernel are filtered and uh, inside the kernel, and the only packets that are, we are interested in are copied to the user space. So packet filters is, the, is one example of such a, of use case for kernel extensions. But once you have this mechanism of registering programs that run inside the kernel, you can think of other uh, applications, such as uh, enforcing security policies by filtering system calls instead of packets, or allowing users to profile kernel events, or monitor kernel, kernel events, and many other use cases. EPF is the Linux way of doing uh, kernel uh, extensions. The UPF system uh, is uh, instruction, an instruction set architecture, which uh, consists of a handful of registers and several memory regions that the program can access. One of them is the context, which is just a simple struct that is passed to the program as a parameter. Uh, in the context, there are pointers to the start and the end of the packet. Uh, the program can also access or allocate shared regions to communicate with user space uh, processes or with other EPF programs. And it, it also has a very small stack that it can use for whatever it likes, but generally it uses uh, it is used for register spinning. The programs can do arithmetic, load store, jumps, like any other uh, instruction set architecture. And uh, they also have uh, special dedicated instructions for interacting with the kernel. So you can think about these programs as if they are very low level scripting languages, scripting language for uh, the kernel. So here's one example. We want to implement a simple packet filter. 
So at the start of the program, we load a pointer to the start of the packet. We increment a pointer to eight bytes after the start of the packet. We load the pointer to the end of the packet and check that the packet is indeed of size at least at eight, which means we can read uh, eight bytes from the packet and decide whether or not to filter it out or uh, pass it through. The execution model of the eBPF uh, pro uh, program is, for performance reason, is uh, consists of a compiler. So uh, the user space process sends an eBPF program to the comp compiler, and the compiler translates it uh, very straightforwardly to an x86 uh, program. Of course, this translation, uh, given that it is simple and it contains no instrumentation code, can easily uh, help uh, malicious code take over the kernel. So, the Linux uh, developers added a verifier, a mandatory verifier that stands before the compiler, and any EVPF program must pass a verification phase after which uh, we know that the resulting x86 code will cause no harm to the system. And that's an interesting point. Uh, as I mentioned, there already is a full-blown program verifier inside the Linux kernel. What do we verify in these uh, programs? Uh, we must verify absence of memory errors. We do not want a ring zero uh, code to access arbitrary locations in the kernel. We verify that there are no, uh, that there's no information leakage, uh, that uh, sensitive information from the kernel does not leak to user space, and sensitive information uh, might be the uh, relative ordering of different regions. So we don't allow, for example, comparison between pointers to different regions. And we also need to verify terminations because a uh, kernel code must terminate. The current Linux verifier handles its task by uh, enumerating all the paths. Uh, basically, it does, it does a simple DFS over the, over the control flow graph. Uh, it uses a combination of intervals, bit values, identities, and it looks for uh, some specific patterns uh, of access of, uh, to the packet and to other uh, memory regions. So, the current verifier does not have any form of foundation, and it is very difficult to reason about its correctness. Uh, it does not support loops, and it, it is exponential in the number of bunches in the program. In this work, we propose a different verifier, which is based on abstract interpretation, so it will be easier to reason about its correctness. We focus only on safety properties uh, for this time. We handle loops uh, by using the widening operator. The, and the performance is cubic in theory, worst case cubic, but in practice uh, we show it to be linear. So let's talk about some design decisions and when we design the, the abstract interpretation for this, uh, for UPF programs. Let's look at the code from earlier. R2 loads a pointer to the start of the packet. So we must uh, track the fact that it points to the start of the packet and it has an offset zero inside the packet. Then we increment a pointer inside the packet, which poses no problem. And we uh, load a pointer to the end of the packet. But now we can just say, okay, it's pointer to the packet at offset X because we don't know what X is. So we must resort to relational invariants, uh, tracking correlations between pairs of variables in the programs, in the program. So we know that R3 equals to R2 plus 8, and we know that R4 equals to the end of the packet. Now we check that we access that R3 is less than or equal to R4, and we can deduce that R2 uh, has enough space for 8 bytes to read. So this read is safe. So this uh, this is 
uh, this explains two of our design decisions. One, we want uh, to track the types that we point to, the regions that we point to, and we must track uh, variables, uh, correlations between different variables, uh, with different registers. Another issue we must deal with is uh, that of register spinning. Most DBPF programs are translated uh, from uh, using a C compiler, so the uh, the programmer does not have any control on where and when registers are spilled to the stack. Let's look at this uh, example again. Let's say that after we loaded the pointer to the end of the packet, the compiler decided to spill the pointer to the start of the packet. So now we track it essentially same as before by co tracking correlations between stack variables and registers. So, all our environments are the same as before, except we, instead of having R2, uh, we have a sta special stack variable that uh, points, that designated the, designates the locations inside the stack. Eventually, we load uh, the value back from the stack, and we can deduce that the access is again safe. So, how do we implement this uh, memory abstract domain? Uh, it's actually very simple. Each write, uh, de each write defines a new variable in the stack, and when we, when any write touches var existing variables, we simply kill them and write a new variable instead. Our entire analysis can be shown here. It's shown here. Uh, we, the analysis is parametric in the domain for tracking memory regions, and it is parametric in the domain for tracking uh, numerical values, and we handle registers and mem uh, variables in the same way. So uh, we have types and values for registers, types and values for uh, memory vari variables, and uh, we also track which cells or which stack variables are alive and which locations on the stack contain non-pointer or non-secret values. So uh, the program is allowed to leak them outside. And crucially, we, as I said, we, end, we handle registers and memory variables in a similar way. So the numerical domain that we take as parameter tracks correlations between different registers, between different memory variables, and between memory variables and registers. So this analysis and this abstract, uh, abstract do um, domain is very simple, and we should see whether or not it can actually analyze existing programs. So for evaluation, we took uh, nearly 200 programs from real-world projects, essentially every program we could lay, the, lay a hand on. And then the sizes of the program uh, is between two and 3,000 line of uh, instructions. And uh, you should, we should note that all of these programs pass the current verifier because people do not tend to publish um, programs that do not pass the verifier. They become useless. This is the downside of having a mandatory verifier. We also must choose a numerical domain. So here are the, the numerical domains that we tested. Uh, intervals is very simple. Zone is differences between uh, pairs of variables. Octagon is slightly more complex. And polyhedra is a general linear constraints. The precision on over analysis over these programs for the interval domain is very low, as we expected, because intervals do not track correlations between variables. Zone and octagon domain turns out to verify every program except a single one. For technical reasons, polyhedra is not as precise as zone and octagon, even though theoretically it should be more, uh, more precise. Uh, this is because they saturate their uh, uh, variables once they go beyond 64 bits. 
And here's a graph showing the runtime of the different domains that we showed, that we checked. And uh, the, the black line here shows that uh, our, uh, when we choose the CRUBS, CRUB is the framework, verification framework that we used. When we use uh, that, uh, the zone implementation of that verification framework, we are actually uh, pretty usable and we can analyze even the, larger, the largest programs under uh, roughly five seconds. The memory consumption, uh, here again, uh, the zone implementation of CRAB is the best among the relational domains, and uh, we consume up to 1.5 gigabytes for the analysis. And here's an, an interesting comparison with the existing verifier. We took a very simple problem, just a pair of STRN compares, uh, parameterized by the number, of, by the maximum size of the of the string. And this program has quadratic number of branches of paths, and as you can see, uh, the the Linux verifier actually. Uh, runtime grows quadratically, while our tool uh, grows linearly, even if we unroll the loops. And when we do not unroll, unroll the loops, it is actually constant. So, uh, to conclude, we use a verification of kernel extensions already in industrial use, but very simple abstract interpretation might be even better. What we designed is actually, I believe it is extremely simple, and nevertheless it is provably useful. And this is an opportunity for the verification community that instead of having uh, formal verification regarded as something that inhibits people from doing what they want, we can use it as an enabler, something that gives people more opportunities, more ways to do what they want to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for some questions. Please uh, let us know your name and affiliation. Uh, hi, Renat from Fungible. Um Maybe I missed this part. Have you found any real bugs? Uh, I mean, uh, memory problems, uh, whatever you listed at the, at the beginning of the presentation. There, there were some bugs. There are no some known bugs in earlier versions of the verifier, uh, but we didn't look for anything like that. I'm Mother Sudan from University of Illinois. Um, so I was wondering, it's a more meta question. Do you believe that there are I mean, from what I see, it looks like a simple case of abstract interpretation used tailored to a, an application. Do you believe that there are lots more applications we're not looking at, not more domains where simple abstract uh, interpretation could be useful? I do not have the experience to answer this question. Hi, I'm Jacob from University of Washington. Uh, great work, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm curious, though, uh, how the performance of the verifier uh, improves the performance of uh, applications overall? Like, do you have any idea of what the percentage of this verification time is for a uh, real world application? Uh, we do not have numbers for that, but the idea is that registering the, the programs is done once. So it doesn't matter if it's kind of slow because the, the programs run inside the kernel more than they are uh, on, in the verifier. Thank you.